who you are, the God of miracles. Amen. Amen. So this morning I want to talk about the God of miracles. Um, I've always loved the book of Psalms because in the book of Psalms you've got just about every possible human experience, every emotion there in the book of Psalms. A lot of them, of course, were written by David. In many of them, he's going through a hard time. People are giving him a hard time. In some of them, he's about on the verge of giving up. And then there are others where he's praising God with all his heart, without a care in the world. And you've got those two extremes and just about everything else in between. I think I started really getting stuck into the book of Psalms when our children were young. We used to read through mainly the Gospels. In the mornings at the breakfast table, after we'd eaten, we'd, we'd read, we'd read with, with, together as a family and we would pray. And then at night, we would read a psalm with them. And then I got into a pattern myself in more recent years of reading a psalm and sitting thinking about it every night. And then, as many of you know, actually four years ago today, I preached to a totally empty auditorium. Yeah, I really ticked some people off the week before, I think. That's what it was. You know, nobody came. <laughs> Not a soul came. No, that was the beginning of the COVID lockdown. And, and that was four years ago today that I was preaching here to an absolutely empty auditorium. And did that for six months. And uh, there was a very small but faithful, committed, terrific team comprising our production team and our band. Charlotte was there with us always. And I will put a shout out to Phil Bazanka who came as well and made sure we were caffeinated every Sunday morning, which <laughs> is probably the most important part of the whole setup. But that was the beginning. And, and some of you will remember, you know, at the beginning of the whole COVID experience, you know, it was, it was unnerving, it was confusing, it was scary. And... Uh, we weren't able to connect like we normally did. And so, as well as putting our services online, I decided that at nighttime, I would do my Bible reading from the book of Psalms on, live on Facebook. And so, every night at 9 o'clock, I would read a, a psalm from the book of Psalms, working through the book. And I still do it. I've done it every night, uh, virtually every night. I've been here and there sometimes, but others have continued it for me when I'm not there. But we've done that... Uh, on a nightly basis now for four years. And it's quite amazing. People I run into here and there say, I watch you at night. I, I look forward to, before I go to bed, I listen to you reading a psalm. And uh, somebody said, it's the English accent. It really makes a difference. <laughs> so I'll keep it. But I, but I totally love the book of Psalms. And a, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was reading, not in my nightly readings, but I was just reading, I, I was drawn to Psalm 77. And I'm reading Psalm 77, and Psalm 77 starts with the writer feeling abandoned by God, lost, alone. And that's never a good rabbit hole to go down. But then he starts reminding himself of how God had come through in the past and of the miracles that he had seen. And then he gets to a place where it sounds like his head was beginning to clear and his heart began to open up. And he made this declaration that I want us to just spend some time in this morning. In Psalm 77, verse 13 and 14. So now after all his complaining and confusion, he comes and says this, O oh God, your ways are holy. Where is there any other as mighty as you? You are the God of miracles and wonders. You still demonstrate your awesome power. In the midst of his confusion, in, in, in the middle of his doubting, he came to this place where suddenly he realizes and reminds himself afresh God is the God of miracles and wonders, and he still demonstrates his awesome power. 
And what I want to remind you all of this morning is this, where you might be in life today and whatever you might be dealing with this Sunday morning, I want to remind you that God is the God of miracles and wonders, and He still demonstrates His awesome power. God is the God of miracles and wonders, and He still demonstrates His awesome power. Now, if you're sitting here today and said, well, basically my life's good just now. I don't know if I really need this. Put it in your back pocket, because you will at some time. Because we all go through different experiences in life. We all go through the experience the psalmist did here. But in his darkest moments, he suddenly comes to realize, wait a minute. The first thing I'm going to pull out of this text is this. Something for all of us to remember. God knows what he's doing. God knows whatever is going on with us. God knows what He's doing. Verse 13, here's what He said. He said, Oh God, Your ways are holy. Now, you, you all know me. Um, I don't know Greek and I don't know Hebrew. I do know the Bible was initially written in Old Testament Hebrew, New Testament Greek, and I've got books that explain. So, out of one of my books that explain things, I discovered that the word that holy that's used in the Old Testament and in this place, it, it could actually be translated simply by different. God, you're different. You're different. God, I'm looking at my life just now and I can't understand anything, but here's what I recognize. God, you're different. God's in a different league than we are. He is different. Romans eleven thirty three 33 says this, Oh, what a wonderful God we have. How great are His wisdom and knowledge and riches. How impossible it is for us to understand His decisions and His methods. It is impossible for us to understand His decisions and His methods. And times when we have got no idea what's going on and why, we need to realize we'll fry our brains if we try to understand. Because nobody can understand God's decisions and God's methods. When life seems out of control, here's the deal. We need to get to the place where we say, but God, I know you've got this. God, I know you're in control. So, spoiler alert, one of the stories I put in the book, and some of you have heard this before, one of the stories I put in that book happened to us one Sunday morning in Mastic. And uh, for those of you new to us, before we were in this building, we, we were operating for a while with two campuses, one in a movie theater in Ronkonkoma and another in a movie theater in Mastic. And, uh, and the, you know, myself or whoever was preaching rushed between the two on a Sunday morning and preached in both places. So we operated that way, that way for a while. And in Mastic, we had a lot of people who didn't have church background, whatever. Some of them come from a, a, a really totally unchurched and, and un, ungodly sort of past lives. And I'm preaching one Sunday morning, and uh, I'm talking about praying and saying, you know, so often we tell God what He ought to do. And we call it prayer. Lord, will you? Uh, we're not asking, will you? We're telling him what to do, right? I mean, let's be honest about it, you know? God, this is what we want you to do. And, and I said, you know, so often we're, we're just telling God what to do as if we're in control. And I said, what was your life like before you came to Jesus and you were totally in control? That's called a rhetorical question. It means I'm not looking for an answer from anybody out there, right? But some of the folks there didn't know that. So I said, so what was your life like when you were totally in control and you hadn't given it to Jesus yet, and a guy who hadn't been with us long, hadn't been saved long, came from a really rough background, sitting over on my right, I can picture it still. He shouts out an expletive loudly. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, without Jesus, 
our lives were not good. <laughs> but so often, when things aren't going the way we think they should, we think God's messed up. And the first step to seeing turnaround in our situation is to recognize God knows what he's doing. A.W. Tozer was a brilliant writer and speaker. He said this, God's wisdom transcends human intellect. It is not for us to fully grasp. Sorry, it's not for us to fully grasp his ways, but to trust in his perfect knowledge and sovereignty over all things. We can't grasp his ways, but God knows what he's doing. God, God, said, God said to Israel uh, in Isaiah 55, verse 8, he said, look, I don't think the way you think. The way you work isn't the way I work. This is God's decree, I'm telling you. For as the sky soars high above earth, so the way I work surpasses the way you work, and the way I think is beyond the way you think. God, why is this going on? You're not going to know because you couldn't understand. We can't understand God's ways. We can't conceive of, of, of the way that God operates. And there comes a time when we need to surrender our limited understanding to God's infinite wisdom. There's a verse in the book of Proverbs that many of you will know well. And it says this, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. And it may be through your tears this morning that you need to look up to heaven and say, but God, I believe you and you know what you're doing. It may be with gritted teeth today, clenched fists, that you're saying, okay, God, you know what you're doing. Because he does. He does. In the middle of the most trying times of life that we can't understand and that cause us to doubt God's love or wonder whether he's close to us at all, in those moments we need to get to a place where we recognize this. God, you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. That's the starting point. But then the next point is this, to remind ourselves that God is unrivaled. God is unrivaled. Let's look at the next bit of verse 13. Oh God, your ways are holy. Where is there any other as mighty as you? Where is there any other as mighty as you? There, there was a time in the ministry of Jesus when he talked about what he was looking for in those who followed him. And a lot of those who had been going around listening to his teaching couldn't cope with that. They couldn't cope with what he demanded and expected of them. In John 6, 66, it says this. After this, a lot of his disciples left. They no longer wanted to be associated with him. A lot of those who'd been followers left him. And then Jesus turned to the 12 and said, well, what about you guys? Are you going to? And verse 68 says this, Peter replied, Master, to whom would we go? You have the words of real life, eternal life. Lord, there's nowhere else to go. There's nobody else that we could turn to. There's nobody, Lord, that's quite like you. So they were totally committed and they recognized that Jesus was unrivaled. And I want to remind you all today, Jesus is unrivaled. He's not one among many. Every faith's got its God. Well, maybe so, but the God's with a small g. There is one God and Father of all. That's what the Scripture tells us. God is absolutely unrivaled. There is nobody like our God. I'll say that again. If you want to say amen, I know it's early, but I'll say that again, all right? There is no one like our God. Amen. Whoa, God is absolutely unrivaled. And, and, and you know what? That, that just speaks faith into my heart. 
when I remember that. There's nobody like our God. God really is great. Life stinks, but God's great. God's great. I can't see the way forward. But he makes a way where there is no way. Because there's nobody like our God. And when we're going through trials, you know, that's the time to push in nearer to God, not a time to draw back from God. Proverbs 3, 5 that we looked at just now. The second part of it reminds us of this. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. We just need to remember God's greatness. Don't try to figure it out on your own. I remember years ago, I was preaching in Dublin, Ireland, and uh, I had flown into Belfast and was going to take the train from Belfast down to Dublin. And uh, I, I went from the airport over to the station. And this was, this was in the time of the, all the troubles uh, in, the, in Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, between the, the, the IRA and um, the Unionists. And uh, people were getting killed and murdered and all kinds of stuff and particularly around the border area. And this train went right through what they called the bandit country. And so I go to the station, and people had said to me, aren't you nervous going there just now? I said, no, I'm good. <laughs> and then I got to, I, I got, you know, our, my train pulled in, and along the side of the carriage, there were bullet marks. <laughs> but no, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I just sat on the other side of the carriage. <laughs> I'm going this side, looks safer. Yeah, that was kind of a dangerous place to be. I remember when I was, when I was um, in the early 90s when I started working with homeless ministry um, on the Lower East Side. And, and back then, you know, at night particularly, Alphabet City wasn't a great place to be. But I'll tell you where the most dangerous place is that I've ever been. Inside my own head. That's the most dangerous place. Because inside my head, I've gone to some very dark places at times. And we all can. Which is why the scripture tells us, don't try to figure out everything on your own. Just, just remembering God knows what he's doing, and God is unrivaled. Psalm 86, verse 8, there's no one quite like you among the gods, O Lord, and nothing to compare with your works. God is aware of where we are, and God is above everything and everybody. So the third thing is this. God is all-powerful. God is all-powerful. Psalm 77, verse 14 then. The next, the, the next bit goes on to say this. You are the God of miracles and wonders. You still demonstrate your awesome power. You are the God of miracles and wonders. You still demonstrate your awesome power. Just look around you this morning. This room is full of miracles. Or just look in the mirror. We are miracles of the grace of God. We are miracles of the faithfulness of God. And we've seen miracles, every single one of us in various ways. We've seen them happen in our lives. And you know something? When, when, when things are impossible, you, you're in the position then to actually see God perform a miracle. Miracles happen in impossible situations. Miracles don't happen when everything's good and rosy and life's good. You don't need a miracle on those days. You need a miracle when your boat's sinking. 
That's when you need a miracle. You're, you're, you need a miracle when, when, when you've heard something that, that you, is so devastating that you wonder if there's a future because you can't see a way out. That's when you need a miracle. And I just want to remind every single one of you today that God is the God of miracles and wonders, and He still demonstrates His awesome power. Listen, God knows what He's doing. God is unrivaled, and God is all-powerful all-powerful. So let me illustrate that with two Bible stories that you will be pretty familiar with, and uh, I love both of these. Judges chapter 6, the story of Gideon, which is one that many of you will be familiar with, right? So the story was that the Israelite people were being oppressed by this nation called the Midianites, and one of the ways in which they persecuted them was with Israel being an agricultural nation. They relied on the harvest. And every year at harvest time, when they were gathered, had gathered the harvest, the Midianites basically would come in and steal all of their crops. So they were left penniless because they had nothing to sell, and they were, they were left wondering how they were going to make it because they had nothing to eat. And the Midianites had done this for a while. And then there's this guy called Gideon we're introduced to in Judges chapter 6, and he's off someplace just hiding away, and, and, and he's threshing some wheat there and, and trying to kind of keep it secret from the Midianites when the angel of the Lord comes to him. That's, that's the way the Bible tells it to us. The angel of the Lord comes. And here's, here's what happens. Verse 12 of Judges 6. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty soldier, <laughs> he didn't feel like that, Mighty soldier, the Lord is with you. Stranger, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? You ever been there? If God's with us, why the heck? Good question. And where are all his miracles that our ancestors have told us about? Such as when God brought them out of Egypt. Now the Lord has thrown us away and has let the Midianites completely ruin us. God's with us, don't see much evidence of that. If God's with us, how come we don't see any of the miracles that our forefathers talked about? Haven't seen any of that. God's forgotten us. God's abandoned us. Then the Lord turned to him and said, I will make you strong. Go and save Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Okay, Cliff's Notes. Right? So Gideon gets together an army because the Midianites were fierce soldiers with incredible weapons. He gets an army together. And, and he has got an army of 30,000 men together. And God says, that's too many. Tells him to pare them down. And he pares them down. And, he, and, and, and then God says, that's still too many. And in the end, he's got 300 people. And Gideon with these 300 people. And he says, here, here, I'll tell you what your weapons are. I want you to give everybody a trumpet, a pitcher, and a, and a candle. Great. These are war tactics, folks. <laughs> right? A trumpet, a pitcher, and a candle. And put the candle inside the pitcher. And here's what I want you to do. Go spread, spread out around the Midianite camp. And, and Gideon, you give the signal. When Gideon gives the signal... Everybody shouts. And when you shout, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, and everybody shouts out at the top of their voice, you smash the pitcher so suddenly all the lights appear around them and you blow the trumpets. And they did that, and it frightened the life out of the Midianites. It was the middle of the night. They were totally confused. They started attacking each other and killing each other. And those, that, those who didn't kill each other, then, then is, the, the Israelites went in and finished off. It's an amazing story. But Gideon's sitting there feeling sorry for himself and scared, saying, well, if God's with us, where's the miracle? And God said, go. If you'll take a step, and Gideon had to move out from where he was. And miracles often don't happen if we're just 
sitting back waiting for God to wave his magic wand. But we have to be sensitive to the voice of God that tells us what our first step is. Peter would never have walked on water if he hadn't taken the step of getting out of the boat. And if you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. What's the step you need to take? Listen. Listen for God to tell you. And expect God to be with you and to do the unexpected. Now, there's a second story in the, in the second book of Kings, chapter 4, that's kind of tucked away there and some folks aren't too aware of. It, it's about Elisha the prophet. And it, Elisha the prophet, one day, a lady comes to him. She had been recently widowed. She had two sons. And she said, I don't know what to do. My husband died leaving a lot of debt behind. And the guy he owes all this to says, if I don't pay up, he's going to come and take my two sons and they're going to become his slaves. And she said, they're all I've got and they're all the support I've got and I've just lost my husband. And Elisha says to him, what have you got in your house? She said, I haven't got much at all. All I've got is I've got a bit of oil. And Elisha said to her, here's what I want you to do. I want you to collect all the pots and containers you can find around the house. And I want you to start pouring the oil into those containers. Strange thing. But she did it. And as she poured oil out of her container into these others, it kept coming. And it kept coming. And it kept coming. So they, so they, you know, they started going around to the neighbors saying, quick, give me a pot, give me a pot. And, and she's, filling, she's filling up from, from this thing that's never, give it, never giving out. And, and, and then there came a point where every pot that was there was full. And, and, and Elisha said, hey, isn't there any more? And she said, that's the lot. And in that moment, there was no more oil left. And he said, go and sell all this oil in these containers and pay the debt. This isn't just a book of stories. It's a book that reminds us that God is the God of miracles. And what he did for that widow, he can do for you. What she did is she listened to the voice of the prophet and she made space for God to move. Hey, that's what we've done this Sunday morning. We've made space for God to move. You stop presenting empty chairs, God will stop sending people. But in your life, just now, listen to the voice of God and make space for God to move. Because God is the God of miracles. Okay? The God of Gideon, the God of Elisha, the God that David was addressing. Psalm 48, verse 14 tells us this. This God is our God forever and ever. Let me say that again. This God is our God forever and ever. Isn't that cool? This God is our God forever and ever and he goes on and says he will be <coughs> he will be our guide even to the end this god is our god which god the god of miracles is our god this god is our god the god who does the impossible is our god the god who defeats the biggest of enemies is our God. The God who provides in the most dire of situations, this God is our God. God is the God of miracles. We need to just listen for his voice and follow the prompting that he gives to us. Now, I know in, in this place this morning, there will be some of you that are facing situations that are too big for you. And when we're in that position in life, you know what we need to do? We need to recognize God knows what he's doing. And to remind ourselves God is unrivaled. And then to remember 
God is all-powerful. I want us to pray together, and I'd like us to take a moment just to pray specifically for those of you here today who say, you know what, I've been really struggling. But today I recognize, God, you know what you're doing. Forgive me for doubting. Forgive me for giving way to fear. God, you know what you're doing. You are above everything. And you are all powerful. And Father, I pray today that you will move in incredible, unexpected, miraculous ways in the lives of your people, your children here. Pray for those that are watching right now online and pray, Lord God, for those that need a miracle. That, Lord God, that their faith will be lifted. That, God, that they will believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You are the God of miracles. God, will you be glorified in every situation, I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Let's, uh, let's stand and sing with the band.